Because you're... <laughs> Keeping us on time, that's right. All right, so we're back to our uh, first of the two afternoon sessions on the nose at 325. Welcome back. And this is the, um, the, we're heading into the final sessions for today's program. In this next panel, we've invited representatives from our compact staff steering committee to explore elements of the compact's regional action plan, also known as RCAP 2.0, which you heard uh, Steve introduce a little bit earlier today. <laughs> Mr. Jim Murley, our Chief Miami Resilience Chief, Officer Chief. Mm -hmm. for Miami-Dade County and an early collaborator in the development and advancement of the compact will be moderating this session. So please give a warm welcome to Mr. Murley and our session panelists. Thank you, Jennifer. And um, I think there's some people out there. We can. Uh, uh, we want to start on time because we're uh, the panel before the elected mayors, and we will not be extending our talk into their time. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for introducing us. As, as she said, uh, this is a continuation of the uh, uh, coming out party for RCAP 2.0. Uh, I, I've got it on my, on my phone. You can look at it at that email address of RCAP uh, Roman numeral 2.org. And we've asked um, well, all five of us will talk about specific uh, chapters that we help coordinate with other volunteers uh, to help uh, produce um, updates and new chapters uh, for this edition of RCAP. Uh, my uh, participation at that level was with uh, Jennifer. We were co-chairing the Regional uh, Economic Resilience chapter, a brand new edition uh, to RCAP. And in that section, in which we uh, collaborated on with our economic bus business partners, our Greater Miami Chamber, the Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber, uh, the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance, uh, similar organizations in Palm Beach, uh, we came up with uh, nine strategies, which you'll find uh, in that section. And just to highlight those, a few highlights from my perspective on, on why there's an important section. And these, Strategies are set up to, to move forward. They're, they're our direction. Uh, and so there are a lot of actions that need to be worked on uh, in the next five years as the same way we approached our first edition. Strong emphasis on communication, uh, which many speakers have talked about today. The need to, talk, to reach out to many different kinds of audiences and speak in uh, at a level and language and uh, a way that they can understand uh, the importance of connecting the work around uh, climate change resilience with economic activity. The idea that we can use the, uh, the system of investment to make our communities even stronger, uh, to create jobs and to add resilience to our communities at the same time. There's a need to look at uh, regional uh, standards for infrastructure so that it's a level playing field that if one community says, well, we think it's, you need to build it this way, that, that, that won't have the effect of being a disincentive and sending people to other communities which haven't adopted those standards. So we're not a standard setting organization, but we're going to encourage the use of regional infrastructure standards uh, that can be used in that way. Uh, regional water modeling, a very important function, and we have one of the re our foremost regional water modeler, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Obasakara here with the Water Management District, and, and the Broward County has done such a great job in, in talking about future conditions of, of water and, and flooding, and, and that concept uh, is embedded in, in this resilience strategy. There's been a great discussion at the former panel on the flood insurance program. That's also a focus. And then this edition of uh, RCAP, and especially in the economic resilience section, you'll see the, a, the introduction of the concept of dealing with these issues from the standpoint of equity. Reaching out into communities which may not have even heard about some of these issues before. We partnered with organizations that focus on this as, as their major work, and, and I think we've made a good start. We haven't done everything we need to do, but you'll see in economic resilience uh, which is a very important uh, place for it to be, 
uh, a focus on equity. This is just the beginning, the focus on economic resilience. It's the theme of the summit. It's the focus of the RCAP uh, edition. Uh, you'll hear later today about our statement of collaboration with our business partners. Uh, our other partners in, in the uh, universities, Florida uh, International University, just put out today, getting ahead of the curve with a resilient economy. So a lot of people uh, are starting to focus on this area. So I see a, a great opportunity to, um, to move this whole area forward and to make Southeast Florida a recognized national and international leader uh, in talking about uh, resilience from the standpoint of economy. I want to give a good uh, credit to my co-chair, Jennifer Gerardo, who, who really pushed this issue. She has a personal commitment to it. Uh, she's uh, talked long and, and patiently with our new business partners. And uh, I, I know that as we move forward, uh, they're going to be, um, they're, they're going to enjoy working with us on this. I just have one advice to our business partners, because Jennifer has a lead on this. Just surrender now. <laughs> it's, it's, you, don't need to, you don't need to drag this out. She's going to get you where, where, where we need to go. All of us on the steering committee have, have learned that. So uh, I look forward to working with Jennifer as we go forward. Um, our first speaker, uh, as we move forward in exploring other areas of our CAP 2, is Susie Pelriente, uh, now the uh, assistant city manager and the CRO. She, partners with me on the Rockefeller uh, 100 Resilient Cities program, now in the city of Miami Beach, before that the city of Fort Lauderdale, before that Miami-Dade County, yep. a true regional representative, okay. Susie. Thank you, Jim. It's uh, great to be back in uh, Broward County in Fort Lauderdale. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, doing an amazing job as always, so um, it's great to be on this panel with an um, old friend from the steering committee. Um, I guess I'll start by um, just a, a sentence from our cap. Um, the original one, which I thought was really uh, important and it's really guided us over the last five years. And it's that it's, it, our, the, the RCAP was an, um, an original kind of regional framework that recognized our diversity and our varying degrees of progress. And the objective was to integrate the recommendations of, of the RCAP into the existing decision-making systems. And I think we've actually been very successful at that, again, at varying degrees and each one of us working through our own system. I think RCAP 2.0 continues that theme of, of, of mainstreaming um, the work that we're doing. Uh, we've really come a long way. We were here uh, back in 2009, um, and we were much smaller, and we were in a little corner. I think there was about a, maybe not even a full day and uh, about 100 people. And uh, last count I asked today, we're about at 650, which is really amazing to see us grow and, and to, to see us, you know, more and more people. I never would have imagined that I would have seen the panels from this morning talking about uh, real estate and talking about insurance and, and talking about all these complex matters that the climate um, has forced us to, to talk about. I had the, uh, the pleasure and the opportunity to work on the emergency management chapter, again, risk reduction, but we also combined uh, public health. Uh, so that was a bit new to me and I, I learned a lot from that and, and from some of the work that we are doing, Jim and I together with uh, 100 Resilient Cities. Um, the, um, the, the, the resilience, I'm sorry, the, um, the emergency management chapter, the risk reduction uh, chapter. Um, I w I, what I'll do is just I'll point out about five kind of interesting things that have changed since RCAP, uh, the, the original. The um, one note of recommendation is that uh, there's a recommendation to go beyond traditional emergency management planning and response and really plan for more of what we're calling a robust resi resilient recovery. Um, in the event of a catastrophe. So really start thinking about housing, land use changes, uh, start thinking about critical infrastructure. And if something does happen to, in the order of magnitude of, of what happened in Puerto Rico or of Houston, well, how would we rebuild South Florida? What would it look like? And have that plan ready and think about those issues now uh, so then we're ready to really bounce back quickly when something happens. Um, another interesting um, recommendation that's uh, emerged is really urging cities and counties to identify uh, advanced and emerging insurance models. Again, going back to the conversations that we had earlier this morning, um, and a lot of the work that's being done is um, in terms of uh, risk reduction, what are those insurance models? We have spent a lot of time talking to our risk managers, both in cities and in counties, and really thinking about, it's not just about um, 
you know, ensuring things the way we always have for the past, you know, 20, 30, 40 years in government. But really, you know, thinking about these kind of bigger issues and, and, and really the risks that we're facing in the future. Um, also, really kind of enjoyed hearing this this morning too, there was talk about looking at the Florida Building Code. And there was a talk about a lot of success of how the Florida Building Code got stronger after Andrew because of winds. There's a strong recommendation here in the, in the RCAP 2.0 that the whole Florida Building Code really needs a complete look at from top to bottom, from beginning to end, in terms of uh, climate change and sea level rise. And you know, let's get all the smart people of the region and I'll get all those building officials in the room and, and, and show them the science and how can we actually make the, the Florida Building Code even stronger. Um, it doesn't make any sense for us to do that individually. Uh, if we do it by city and by county, um, it's a very tedious process and it doesn't really stick. Uh, and at a city level, we can amend our land use code. And in Miami Beach, we have done that quite a bit. But in terms of the Florida Building Code, it really needs that, that look from top to bottom. And, and I hope that um, the Staff Steering Committee continues to kind of pursue that over the course of, of next year. Um, we're urging cities and counties to integrate the new role of the Chief Resilience Officer into traditional emergency management. Uh, Jim and I have had several conversations um, this year after um, you know, what we went through with the storm in September. And um, I think there is a role for the CRO in that longer term planning. So I think we can, over the next a few years, um, figure that out. And, um, and finally, I think an important one is, um, again, to the whole point of social equity. The, the first RCAP really didn't talk about these issues, uh, didn't talk about you know, some things, and, and we really realized that that needed to be different in terms of economic resilience, public health. Uh, but he, he, social equity is, is a very important thing. And, We've been talking a lot about it lately, uh, you know, qu quite a bit. And, and I want to shout out to my friends in the back, if I don't even see them, if they're still there, the, the Miami Climate Alliance. Um, I've had good conversations with them, and, and they've really kind of opened my eyes to some things. And um, we really need to start to really better connect with highly vulnerable communities and really prepare these communities. Um, I've been involved in government for a long time, and I know that when we activate the EOC, the mayor goes on TV and says, go get three days worth of food. And we can all go to work, I mean, to, to, to the stores. We go to Publix after, after work before we go home. We can pick up our supplies and be ready. Not everybody in our region can do that. And what can we do to actually prepare, you know, every segment of our community so that it's more than just words, but there's actually real preparedness. So I think that's an important recommendation that it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of participation from all, all segments of the communities. Um, quickly, I'll mention that uh, public health is new to the RCAP. It's generally the, the recommendations are along the same lines um, as, as the, of the other sectors that are in uh, the plan. Um, the, the recommendations center around communications, the integration or mainstreaming with existing plans, reducing risk, um, using better data, and uh, an awareness of how climate change um, affects public health in that field. Uh, I think that last summer when we went through the experience of dealing with um, Zika and uh, all the situation that, that stemmed from that, we had to go into high gear and to deal with, um, with, with um, the public health emergency and the mosquito control emergency and really uh, kind of cleaning, cleaning up our, our neighborhoods as best as possible. And you know, we like to say that Zika came to us as a shock and it, we were surprised, but now we can actually prepare for it as a stress. As a, as, a, as a city, we can prepare uh, in terms of our public works and our code and, and the work that we do in the field. Miami-Dade County has done an incredible job of really beefing up their mosquito control. And it's not seasonal anymore. Uh, climate change is throwing seasons out the window. So now mosquito control is actually all year long and mosquito control is actually out. Um, I read an email this morning, they were you know, spraying um, you know, the beach overnight and they're out there in every corner. So that just goes to show you how this work evolves and how uh, we continue to learn and, and again, make uh, the, the work that we do better and, and very you know, attuned to, to the time. So with that, Jim, I'll pass it along back to you. And uh, we'll go now to Jerry Bell, the Sustainable Communities and Transportation. Good afternoon, I'm Jerry Bell. I am the Assistant Director for Planning with Miami-Dade County. Um, I had the privilege of working on the Sustainable Communities and uh, Transportation section, along with Nicole Hefty, who is Jim's Deputy Resilience Officer. Um, so it was a real pleasure to work with her. And in the interest of full disclosure, I have to say that it's actually two members of my staff. Kim Brown spearheaded the review of the sustainability 
uh, communities, um, policies, and Banuj Sundar Nasami, along with Lois Bush from FDOT and um, Debbie Griner from Miami Dade WASDE, spearheaded the transportation um, review. So, um, did an excellent job with it. So, as you know, the RCAP, an interesting thing about the RCAP is that in and of itself, it really doesn't have any regulatory authority. The way that it's implemented is it's implemented by being reflected in the conference of plans and the land development regulations of the local governments in the region. It's implemented by the practitioners who can, who can carry the policies forward. So I think that's a really interesting um, aspect of it, and I think that speaks directly to how this chapter um, is set up and the focus of this chapter, which is really to provide assistance to local governments and assistance to practitioners and how they can uh, incorporate uh, climate change, sea level rise, resiliency planning into their planning efforts. So along those lines, um, a key element of this chapter is to incorporate vulnerability and risk information into land use and transportation planning decisions. Uh, this is done through such strategies as incorporating projections into our comprehensive plans, um, data and analysis to maps and policy, using risk assessments as a means to target investments in our communities, and the designation of adaptation action areas. Um, in terms of an, another uh, way that the, uh, the, this chapter helps to guide local governments is, is providing direction on how to use the available planning tools to adapt to climate change impacts and increase resilience of our communities. These are things like local ad adaptation strategies, green building standards, uh, preserving our at-risk historic and archeological resources. Um, also looks at how, what we can do to promote resilient low carbon development. And examples of resilient low carbon development would be transit oriented developments, doing more compact walkable communities, incorporating sustainable design techniques that increase access to vulnerable transportation system users, more efficient land use patterns, how can we better use unused and underutilized parcels, uh, looking at you know, big picture things like supporting economic growth and affordable housing near transit, enhancing this urban tree canopy, phasing out septic systems. Also looking, and this is the transportation component, what we do to promote efficient low carbon movement of people and freight through the area. Uh, looking here at things, their policies about expanding bicycle and pedestrian networks, a higher investment priority to transportation nodes that reduce emissions, increase transit use. So um, it's a big picture chapter, and um, the update process really focused on, we had an excellent team. Um, we coordinated with representatives from the different counties, from the municipalities, from transportation agencies, from planning agencies. I started off with a very robust initial public work, uh, initial work group session where we received a lot of input, and then we carried that forward through online document review, through additional meetings, through uh, conference calls. And based on the input we received from this process, the real key change for this, for this section focused on better organizing it, recognizing that, it, that our users are the practitioners of local governments, making it more user friendly, uh, providing for increased coordination with the various audiences that use the RCAP. So the summary of the key updates that we made for this chapter would be more guidance relating to your adaptation action areas, a stronger focus on social equity outcomes, uh, in terms of transportation, looking at the various changes in technology and how those impact it, things like automated self-driving vehicles, um, a general shift from gas-driven vehicles to electric vehicles, and a shift from single occupancy vehicles to high occupancy vehicles. So uh, that's a summary of the uh, chapter and the basic changes that we made, or that are recommended. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, next, Chris Berg from the Nature Conservancy, a, a natural popularization that's been part of our compact since the very beginning, uh, natural systems and agriculture. Chris? Thank you, Jim. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to start by recognizing that, uh, in addition to myself, Mike Roberts from the Monroe County Growth Management Division was a co-chair in developing these chapters, and we had a lot of help, um, like these others, with the working groups for each of the chapters. A lot of people from a lot of organizations contributing their time, and this was really, really wonderful. So a lot of times, um, uh, agriculture and natural systems are framed uh, as competing land uses or conflicting land uses, but in fact, when it comes to climate change, they really share a lot of commonalities. The ways that climate change are affecting them are often similar, uh, so it made sense to uh, join these together in some, uh, some ways. So crops, for example, natural systems themselves, the natural species populations that depend upon them uh, are all supported by very specific uh, climate uh, factors, so precipitation, temperature uh, and other environmental variables like salinity really shape what can live where and how, it, how well it thrives. So climate change and sea level rise are changing uh, those variables and changing uh, the ability of these uh, populations or, or crop systems to uh, do what they've been doing uh, for many, many uh, thousands of years in the case of the natural systems or 
uh, hundred or so years in the case of the crop systems. And uh, the status quo is, is at risk. I think that's obvious with all of the climate change uh, issues that we face. And really there's a lot to lose. So agriculture along with uh, real estate and along with tourism is the one of the three top uh, economic sectors here in the state of Florida. Uh, the Southeast Florida region has some incredibly valuable uh, agricultural um, products, uh, particularly in the uh, South Dade region and in the uh, Palm Beach County region. Um, and then our natural systems, in addition to the you know, sort of fundamental value of the biological diversity, the plants, animals, um, and uh, genetic diversity that's found in them, are really important to people and to our communities from the standpoint of the ecosystem services that they provide to us. So you've heard uh, several speakers earlier today talk about the protective role that coral reefs or other natural systems provide for us as the front line of defense against uh, uh, storms, <laughs> the erosion and the flooding that they bring to our shores. That's very much an example of an ecosystem service. The uh, water quality and uh, water storage uh, capacity that the natural systems provide the valuable fisheries, the uh, ecotourism, and others are, are yet more examples of ecosystem services that we really depend upon, not only for our economy, but for our quality of life. So um, there were there are a number of uh, shared threats that climate change brings to both agriculture and natural systems, uh, invasive species or pests and pathogens, uh, as it's, they're often referred to in the agriculture context, are examples of those. Um, just like uh, native species, they are governed by climate conditions. Uh, so as the climate warms, we're beginning to see uh, the ranges of these, some of these species extend further northward. We're starting to see more of them uh, coming in and spreading more uh, aggressively as a result of climate change. Um, the availability of clean, fresh water is critical both for agriculture and for natural systems. I think you're gonna hear more about that uh, from uh, Dr. Obi Sakara next. Um, the uh, science, so the need for better science, not just to predict what climate change is going to uh, bring uh, to these, these vital uh, aspects of our economy and our, and our ecosystem, but also to begin to test uh, the responses. How are we going to deal with these climate changes? How are we going to uh, maintain, uh, to the extent possible, the status quo or adapt uh, our uh, agriculture systems, our native species populations and so on so that they can continue to um, serve us and, and benefit us. Um, I'm just gonna touch on a couple of the new items. Uh, many of the items from the RCAP 1.0 were carried through to uh, version two. We tried uh, in this version two to make them even more specific to the climate aspects of these challenges for water, for um, plant populations and so on, or for various, uh, agricultural aspects, but I'll just, just pick out a couple of things that I thought were highlights. Um, there was a proposal in the natural systems, uh, one of the natural systems action to develop a species dispersal and conservation plan. So we know that if we uh, just allow uh, climate change impacts to occur and we don't help uh, natural systems and native species uh, move with the changes or adapt to those changes, they are likely to run up against the built environment, built the uh, urban environment, and in some cases uh, suffer as a result. So uh, the call to create a specific adaptation plan that will allow them to migrate using natural corridors if possible, or if necessary, actually picking up and moving species around these barriers uh, was one of the interesting new uh, proposals. Um, the first go around in RCAP 1.0, we didn't address fisheries in any real sense, uh, so for Version 2.0, there was a proposal to look at the valuable fisheries that are found here in Southeast Florida, from the spiny lobster and stone crab uh, to the fin fish, and uh, see if we can anticipate how climate change is going to uh, impact them and see if we can help them and the fisheries and the fishermen uh, who depend upon them adapt as well. On the agriculture side, uh, the concept of making agriculture part of the solution to climate change, not just trying to maintain the the agriculture uh, for all of its inherent values, but trying to help agricultural uh, lands and land uses become part of the solution by sequestering carbon, by uh, serving dual roles, not only as crop production, but also water uh, storage or, or water recharge areas. Uh, 
co-locating uh, solar or wind farms with uh, traditional crop farms uh, was yet another uh, concept. And then um, there was a general class of sort of modernizing agricultural practices. And one of the interesting ones that we had a lot of uh, discussion about was shore-based or land-based aquaculture. There was a lot of debate about whether or not that was really practical. And I found it interesting to read recently that the world's largest land-based salmon farm is coming to Miami-Dade County in the Homestead region. It's under construction right now. So there's somebody out there who thinks that this is a going concern. Uh, so salmon should be available to us soon. <laughs> um, and finally, uh, this was a great example of the uh, RCAP 2.0 public process. We developed a draft, we bounced it off the public, we got input. And one of the things that none of us in the agriculture uh, chapter uh, taught was that we hadn't really thought about the people that are doing the agriculture. We were thinking about the land, we were thinking about the land uses. And one of our uh, respondents uh, brought to our attention that we hadn't factored in the health risks uh, to agricultural workers. And it was added, uh, and I think a really a good addition brought to us by our public process. Good, thanks. It was, we probably should have called this speed dating with our <laughs> <laughs> um, we, the last speaker, uh, is, we all know him and love him, is Obi from the South Florida Water Management District. He's going to cover water resources. And then we will take Q&A until we see the elected officials, in which case we will exit. Hi. Obi. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I have the privilege of uh, speaking for our excellent team we had, the work group. Uh, it was also chaired by Dr. Jennifer Harado and then Hardeep Anand from Miami-Dade uh, Water and Sewer Department. Uh, the team actually consisted of uh, folks from experts from private sector, academia, and uh, many local and um, regional uh, and federal governments. So I think it was a good team. They recognized the complexity of the, uh, the, the issue of water we have, in what I call compounding effects of basically sea level rise, storm surge, increasing temperature, changing rainfall conditions, and changing storm conditions. And, and we realized there's a lot of uncertainty in that. So the group came up with some overarching, basically, principles to put together this, uh, this new version of RCAP. And that was basically uh, based on basically better regional coordination, particularly in the development tools. Um, an application, the consistency and the use of science and technology, and, and also address some spatial and temporal dimensions of the problem. So the team came up with five basic categories and basically restructured the, the previous RCAP recommendations and added a few, and I really like these categories that we came up with because it pretty much covers all the issues that were raised the, this morning, all aspects of water. So I'm going to kind of uh, show some of them. Actually, I had a slide in there, but I'll kind of mention them quickly. Um, first one was coordination of science, policy, and planning. And I think those are all three aspects are important. We need to come up with innovation in, uh, and consistency in planning scenarios, I think, uh, like the sea level rise um, approach we came up with future water supplies, and particularly salt water inclusion that, um, that's important to us um, for water supply. The second category was the infrastructure and data management. We realized that we need to come up with a database of basically resiliency project or projects addressing resiliency, and, and also the impact assessment. We need to conduct impact assessments. Number three was the planning priorities and sustainable design standards. And that was discussed somewhat this morning. And I think this is a big one in terms uh, that the, we need to modernize the standards, uh, particularly, for example, groundwater table is going to increase. We need to, we need to increase water table maps, uh, finish flow elevations. And one highlight of this item was the request to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to revisit the Central and South Florida flux, protect, uh, flux control project, which is 50 years old, and people are talking about that. It's not, um, it's not probably functioning as it was designed for various reasons. And then also uh, something that we are working on at the Water Management District, the level of service, so flood protection and other aspects of water management. Changes in the stormwater rules, 
and practice integrated water resources management uh, and include things like green infrastructure that was discussed this morning. So that was a, a comprehensive item there. The other uh, item was the coordination of research and technology. Uh, we need to foster water management research, uh, particularly in the climate modeling uh, world. We know there's a lot of, there are a lot of uncertainties and promote risk-based decision making. And I think that's, a, that's an area we need to work on and partnerships with uh, entities like Florida Climate Institute and federal agencies and others. And the last but not least, and I think this was discussed heavily this morning, the capital projects and funding and investments. You know, we really, we understand we need innovative funding approaches. And more importantly, we have big projects like the Everglades Restoration, which we think is one of the best um, adaptation strategies that could benefit everybody, including water supply. I think we need to support that effort um, in the region. And, and one other item I really like is what we call adaptable infrastructure. Yeah, I think in this world of uncertainty, um, adaptable designs for infrastructure enhancement, I think for water resources will go a long way. And we also need to expand our water storage areas, not only for flood protection, but also for water supply. So these five categories actually took all the 21 uh, recommendations, including some new ones. And, and, and basically these will allow us to monitor how we progress in the water sector in implementing our cap. So that's pretty much it. Thank you, Obi. Thank you, panel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we can take some questions. Get up so I can. Who's that distinguished gentleman? <laughs> it's a grandfather. Mr. Roy Rogers, please. And then uh, I can hold it. Thanks. Oh, we have to hold it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hello, Hi. panel. How are you? In regard to uh, what we're doing, a lot of the solutions are going to come from not us of this generation, certainly not me, but uh, to our youth. So the question of the entire panel is, are you satisfied with the outreach to youth? And is the awareness coming along as we all hope it will be? Thank you. Well, it's my impression, uh, Roy, that we're going in the right direction. I think satisfied is too strong a word. I think there's lots of room for improvement. But I do think that uh, young people today are aware that there are, is a problem and that they're aware that uh, solutions are needed. And I think they're increasingly holding the rest of our uh, slightly older feet to the fire. And uh, so I think, it's, I think it's going in the right direction. Obi? Yeah, if, if I can add, if you asked me five years ago, I would say no, we you know, go to a high school or elementary school, the kids have no idea what we are talking about. But I think today things are changing. There's a lot of out outreach from the local governments, even the, in the NGOs like Clear Institute and others to reach out to younger generation. I think they are paying the way, but I think we can do more to bring the young generation to be aware of these issues and they are the ones who are going to face this in the future more so than we are. Over here, which direction? Over here? Uh, hi, my name is Alyssa. Um, what can this group do to help facilitate cooperation among the counties? Um, obviously, uh, that issue was recognized in uh, cooperation because there's a section dedicated to it, but uh, it's a little bit high level and aspirational. It's not exactly a, a roadmap. And my fear is that without uh, help from a high level organization such as the Compact, uh, uh, cooperation may only come from people who have personal relationships as opposed to the four counties working together. Well, that's a. I think that's an excellent question. I think it goes probably to the, in one side, it goes to the very core of what we tried to do with the compact collaboration. I've been involved in government for a long time, and often what happens with new initiatives is you, you go off and create something new to, to handle it. In this case, the counties themselves, and now this, and with the cities, took this upon themselves to create the compact and working with our partners to move it forward. Doesn't mean that there aren't other areas we couldn't expand, but to, to some degree, the very, the very skeleton bones of the compact are built along those lines. Now, Susie, you've been, you've been with us a long time, and <laughs> you've thought about this. You might want to add to it. Well, 
it, you said the word relationships, and, and I think that's very important. You know, Jim mentioned that I, I grew up in the county, spent time in Fort Lauderdale, and now I'm back in Miami Beach. And um, you know, there's so many people out in the audience that I know, and I can pick up the phone, and they're a resource. And so while structure is great, relationships are better. And so um, the work that we do, that's what we need. I mean, I'm looking at Nancy right now, and, and I know that you know, if, I, if I get stuck on a science question, you know, she's just a phone call away. So um, you need both, structure and, and people. I would just add, there have been a couple of um, efforts led by the Compaq uh, Center Conception. Uh, since RCAP 1.0 was released, um, specific workshops that brought together members of local governments, counties, um, the academic community, uh, for-profit consultants, and so on, NGOs. Uh, and, and that was one avenue for creating relationships like those. And another, uh, which is a different model, is the Shoreline Resilience Working Group, which my organization uh, coordinates on behalf of the Compact, where we meet uh, repeatedly. Uh, at one time, we were having phone calls monthly and trying to meet every six months, uh, dealing with you know identifying the nature-based solutions for coastal erosion and flooding. Uh, so those are just two models, but there are lots more uh, possibilities out there. Obi, a quick one? Or yeah, very quickly. Uh, I, I think uh, at least Compact for, for us on the Water Management District, it's, it's, a, it's a place where we can meet all the county staff and work with them. And, I, and when we do something um, at the Water Management District, we invite all the county staff on technical workshops that we host. On We have done so water intrusion, decision making. I think that's a great way to bring counties together on technical issues that we work on. And we also help bring uh, federal funds uh, for the region by writing proposals together with different counties. So I think there are many ways that we collaborate already. The Compact has always had both the South Florida Water Management District and the South Florida Regional Planning Council as, as part of their format. So there's, those are two multi-county organizations that have been there since the beginning. And we should go to Nancy. Nancy, go. Uh, when the RCAP 1 was put out, for implementation, there was a recognition that a lot of the work was going to happen at the local municipality re level rather than at the county level, that the compact had things they needed to do, that each county had things they needed to do, and then the municipalities needed to jump in and, and take on some of those action items. At that time, one of the ways that they raised awareness was to request resolutions from the various municipalities to say that they would implement the RCAP. What is the rollout to the municipalities on RCAP 2 in terms of raising awareness and trying to get commitments to provide for implementation of RCAP 2.0? It's going to be very similar, I would imagine. Um, definitely, we, uh, after the four counties adopt um, uh, the, the actual plan, uh, there's going to be kind of that rollout uh, to, to the cities. Uh, we've talked about actually having you know individual visits and, and showing folks how to use the the actual website the way that Steve explained this morning. Um, I think it's a much better product than my original RCAP that had just like you know your name on the border. <laughs> you know um, the fact that we can actually tailor it and create these documents. You know I can sit with another assistant city manager. You know uh, Jim can talk to other CROs. We can you know go and 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 you know you can talk to the different planners. I think there should be um, kind of a little bit of one-on-one -on -one so that we can take this further. Uh, it's my understanding that it's a, we have about a third of the cities, right, that, that are um, kind of that are committed to uh, supporting the RCAP and committed to using the sea level rise projections. It would be great if we could really have a goal over the next five years to really get to all 100 cities um, and if we really divvy that up and, and really make an impact. So I think it'll be a little bit of what we did and I would, I would hope that it's also a little bit of more personalized one-on-one. -on -one. one of the other things that's happened from my perspective is that the, the, the county structures have evolved too in, in support of RCAP. And so now, you know, we, at the beginning, Dade County didn't really have a focus on the cities. And uh, Mayor Cindy Linner from uh, Pinehurst is here and she reminded me of that. <laughs> and now today we have a, a new person that our county commission uh, authorized. Uh, Jess Foley, who's here, whose job it is to, to cement that coordination between the county and the city. So in some cases, you know, as we move ahead on the, on the technical issue sides, we're evolving the structure so that we could be, have that communication. Next question. Hey, so, um, so two years Over ago here. I started a yeah. master's program at University of Florida studying urban planning. And the second that I got down to Gainesville, I 
pegged this RCAP, and I've done mm -hmm. case studies and research since, you know, for two and a half years now. And I think it is such an incredible initiative, and there's such power to it. And my question is, kind of taking a step away from the intra-regional perspective, this is such a great template and such a great building block for other places around the country, around the world that are looking at sea level rise impacts and climate change impacts. Um, you know, I know the RCAP was um, recognized by President Obama and, and you know, some other up, pretty high up officials. My question is, is um, kind of, you know, taking a, a bird's eye view, is there any kind of initiative to, to maybe interact with other regions or other global um, initiatives going on? Um, and you may have already <laughs> you may have already answered this, but I just I just think that this is such a great initiative and such a great project. And getting all these people in this room, I'd love to see this amplified, and mimicked and mirrored and and um, kind of working out of the intra uh, regional and more into the inter regional, um, you know, up the east coast, west coast. So that that's my question. Is there any kind of initiative to kind of broaden? Suvi, this? I'll take a first shot at that. Yes, and the answer is yes. Um, actually, Jennifer and I um, a few years ago when I was in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we went uh, to uh, Durban, South Africa. It was a city-to-city -city exchange uh, through the International City Managers Association. And uh, we spent a week over there. They, uh, a few months later, they sent a delegation. Um, and then actually Deborah spoke at, at the fifth annual conference here in, in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, they were studying the compact, that, in that relationship, the work that we were doing. Um, you'll be you know, happy to hear that Durban and its surrounding cities uh, signed uh, a compact. I was there for that and actually did a training for the, for the staff on how to operationalize it. And I, just about two or three weeks ago, we heard that um, our other partners through that relationship in Mozambique signed a compact. And earlier this year, uh, again, the compact does have this um, sort of contagious uh, thing about it. Um, I was in uh, Gold Coast, Australia. I was asked to uh, visit them and talk about the work that we're doing. They were intrigued about this regional cooperation. Um, again, talked a lot about the work of the compact, and about a, a month or two ago, they signed their first agreement to work together, uh, the Gold Coast Waterways Authority, with the municipality. So those are at least three examples that I've personally, uh, I'm aware of, that I've worked on. And you're absolutely right, this is the best model of intergovernmental collaboration that I've seen and that I've been a part of. I would uh, take the opportunity to, to credit the uh, our partner, uh, the Institute for Sustainable Communities, and Nancy Schneider and Steve Adams, who are here representing them, uh, they are an international organization that, that uh, organizes uh, regional uh, groups like the Compact and then brings those groups together so we have peer exchanges. So our, our intermediary partner has, has been a, a major force in, in sharing and, uh, what we do and giving us the opportunity to learn what others are doing. Anybody else? Hi, uh, my name is Christian Kamrath, uh, also a graduate student, but at from the University of North Carolina, uh, from Florida originally. But um, I just wanted to comment both on what I think is a great product in the RCAP 2.0, and the fact that the tool is it is itself adaptable. Uh, my question for you was: um, in developing RCAP 2.0, um, was there what considerations were made as far as how um, different municipalities within the four counties can implement them as far as the size of that municipality, how much staff and capacity they have to implement the recommendations that you can now more easily filter. Was, was there discussion on that and how, how do you see you know, different size communities using this? Um, do you see them sort of trying to partner with each other within the county? Is it really just about those relationships and partnerships to build that capacity for those, you know, if there's a planning department with one planner who does 10 different things versus the city of Miami, who has a much larger yeah. staff. I'm just curious on your thoughts on that. Well, before I, um, before I took my current role at the county, I was a consultant who worked with a lot of different cities, smaller cities throughout the region. And in several of those cities, we did try to do a, or we did do a climate change element. And uh, I, I found it challenging to get the right to, um, to get the information. So I think the RCAP 2.0, the format, uh, the information that the compact has available uh, is, is very valuable. And I think, as we talked about in the updates to the sustainability chapter, the way it's going to be implemented, in my mind, is really through the comprehensive plans, through the land development regulations of the various local governments. So uh, they're able to kind of go to the RCAP, get access to the different tools, 
uh, different maps, different information that's available, and also very good policy guidance. So I think it's a, it's a uh, very user-friendly tool, and a lot of, I think, the effort moving forward, at least from our subgroup, will be in working with the, with the various municipalities and, and how they can use the information. Ladies and gentlemen, we're getting the hook. Thank you very much. Would you give, me, give the appreciation of this panel? Well, once again, thanks so much, Jim, and to our staff steering committee for sharing the, your per participation reflections on the uh, RCAP planning process. Uh, we certainly know that there's going to be a lot of effort focused on implementation over the next five years and, and um, really appreciate the point about the municipal participation and outreach as part of that process. Very important. So um, I want to, uh, before I introduce the next panel, just um, pause for a reminder that at 5 p.m., while we have the reception that is taking place, uh, we also have the press conference that is taking place that will be involving our elected and business leadership uh, from 5 to 5.30 in room 301. So please do, uh, those who are interested in attending, make your way over there uh, right after this um, session. So it's now my pleasure to introduce the final panel as part of this afternoon's program featuring the mayors from all four of our compact counties who will reflect on the progress of the compact and our priorities for our individual counties as well as for the region. Moderating this session is Ms. Shannon Estinos with the United States Department of Interior. I hope she's, can I see her? Where is she? There you are, Shannon. I was getting nervous. Thank you. So Ms. Estinos has had a long association with the compact through her previous role as the governing board member with the South Florida Water Management District and a longtime leader on Everglades restoration and sustainable water resource management issues. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Estinos. Thank you. I'd like to ask our elected officials to come on up to the stage if, if they're in the room. Oh, they're getting, then, then uh, I will make some introductory remarks while I have the stage. Good afternoon. Um, again, I'm Shannon Estenoz. I'm the Director of Everglades Restoration for the United States Department of the Interior. And I am so delighted to be back at the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact Summit. Uh, I walked in here this afternoon and was stunned at the, side of the size of the crowd. I understand this is the biggest uh, summit yet, and uh, so we should be very pleased about that. Wonderful. I'm being joined on stage by our illustrious uh, panelists. Um, I, uh, the Southeast Florida Regional uh, Climate Change Compact is in its ninth year of implementation. Uh, the compact has provided a mechanism for partnership um, and regional collaboration on planning and policy and investment. It has provided a mechanism for stakeholder engagement. Uh, it's enjoyed and benefited greatly from the support and participation of the business community. Uh, I view the compact, I, I think the compact is in its prime because it's old enough to have celebrated some important accomplishments, um, but yet there are still so many more complex and difficult challenges before us. One of the secrets of the compact success, of course, is the level of leadership that its uh, partner counties have dedicated to it. And that high level of leadership is on display uh, on our panel today. We are privileged to be joined today by Palm Beach County Mayor Melissa McKinley, by Broward County Mayor, our host mayor, Beam Fur. Miami-Dade County Deputy Mayor Jack Osterholt, and of course Monroe County Mayor David Rice. We have so little time with our leaders today that I'm going to forego detailed introductions if it's okay with the panelists. And instead, I'm going to point you to the, <laughs> I thought you might. Um, I'm gonna point you instead to the bios that are in the summit uh, program if you wanna read a little bit more about these accomplished folks. Although I can tell you that the bios are very short. Um, and their accomplishments are, are, are uh, not fully represented there. So today I'm going to be asking our panelists to close day one of our 2017 summit by providing their perspectives perhaps on some of the discussions they heard today if they were able to come a little bit earlier, but certainly on the successes of the compact so far and what they see as our priority next steps over the next several years. But before we jump directly into those topics, 
I want to provide each of our panelists an opportunity to make any brief introductory comments that you might uh, to get us started. So what I'd like to do is maybe just go north to south because it keeps me organized. So Mayor McKinley, do you want to start? <laughs> sure, and I know that we stand between you and happy hour, so we'll try to <laughs> go as quickly as we can. Um, I'm happy to be up here. The, most of us up here have been mayor for about all of the most three weeks, so uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best. Um, I'm going to focus my comments today because I know my three county counterparts to the south will probably focus more on the coastal impacts of of climate change and sustainability, and I'd like to take a few, up, a few moments to uh, focus on the agricultural uh, impacts of sustain sustainability and uh, climate, climate change. And I do that because my particular district includes the Everglades Agricultural Area, uh, which is one of the largest farming areas in the entire country. And on the compact, you know, we've got three uh, ag-related priorities of preserving economic viability meeting our water needs, um, and that includes uh, Lake Okeechobee and the rainfall issues we have there, saltwater intrusion that we could possibly be facing, um, and to promote local goods. And so uh, on the economic sustainability part, you know, uh, I have mentioned that this particular part of Florida is the largest agricultural community east of the Mississippi and the fifth largest in the nation. In terms of USDA statistics, we have 9.4 million acres in agricultural production in the state of Florida. In particular, in South Florida, we're number one in the U.S. in growing at oranges, grapefruits, sugarcane, and watermelons, uh, number two in bell peppers, cucumbers, strawberries, tomatoes, and raising horses, which is very important, uh, particularly in Palm Beach County, number three in cantaloupes, number four in cabbage and squash, number five in honey, snap peas, and sweet corn, which we're number one this time of the year. It's the second largest industry in Florida. Uh, and that is important because we're feeding not only our local communities, we're feeding our state, we're feeding our nation, we're feeding our world. And what we're going to see as we start to see sea level rise is a western migration of the population. And the further they move west, the further pressure there is uh, placed on those farming communities to turn that farm acreage into rooftops as people look for safer places to live. And so I think it's important when we, we have this conversation to not forget uh, about the agricultural communities and anything that harms those agricultural communities which are already rural, which are already significantly poor, which have high unemployment rates, will put further pressure on our local governments to try to figure out a way to re-employ those people, to move those people to different locations, to build affordable housing, to repair infrastructure um, you know, in those small cities and those small rural areas. So it's an important part of the conversation on sustainability and uh, climate change. So I'm happy to be here today and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Mayor McKinley. <coughs> Mayor Kerr, who came sure. to you next? Um, first of all, I think it's important to make sure uh, if, you're, if you're in a position that I'm in, to make sure you have an inc incredible staff. And I, I will tell you, having a staff like Broward County has with Dr. Gerardo and her and everybody that she works with, it makes our job a lot easier. Uh, it, it should that we have, I think we have empowered them as much as we possibly could to really help us uh, understand, understand the situation we're in, understand the, the issues we face. Because as, you know, as in, in, in the position I'm in, we have to deal with a lot of issues. This isn't the only issue that we get to work with. Work with. Um, and we rely on them. And, and they, are, they have been fantastic, I just have to say. And this, this uh, conference itself is a testament to that. So I really just wanted to say thank you first uh, for keeping us uh, so much in the loop. And what, what I've watched in the, in the couple years that I've been uh, with this, is watching this entire compact change and just go from kind of bringing awareness uh, to the situation to, to this year where it's kind of getting down to the nitty gritty. It's really more, uh, and I like what Susan Torrienti had said about this is, it, thing is becoming mainstream. That's a good word for it because you're starting to see in every single uh, thing that we deal with, whether it's a development contract or it's something with the airport or the seaport, now this has become part of the conversation. And it wasn't part of the conversation before. And that is a, a major step forward. 
And I, I think that that's um, a testament to this compact. I think it's a testament to, every, to all the people in here because everybody's working at it from different angles. But, it's all, but together, it's building momentum. And I think all of us together are, are you know, I see, I see a way forward now. Uh, there are some, you know, you've heard today a lot of the big challenges, and, and you know, particularly on infrastructure and things like that. But uh, I like the fact that the business community is here um, because we have to have them, that has to be part of the solution. And that is, that's a, that's a big connection, and that's a big difference between previous compacts than this one. And so I think, we, I think we're on our way. Wonderful. Okay, Deputy Mayor. You know, this morning I talked a little bit about the fact that a lot of what we do uh, is tied together. Um, the, the success of uh, the compact is that it did all that on its own. And I think Jim said this earlier, and I, I want to stress it again. This wasn't a grant from the federal government. This wasn't a responsibility for us by HUD. This was, this was a group of people who recognized the reality that um, the, comp, the, the environment that we were operating in was going through a significant change, and that that change wasn't going to be isolated in any one small segment of our region, but would be the whole region. And they put this together, and it has been a roaring success from my perspective. The, uh, you know, the, that brings me to a, the conversation that the mayor is sorry he can't be here. Something horrible showed up, nothing bad, just something uh, very disruptive showed up he had to deal with. But he feels very strongly about this, very strongly about the fact that uh, the, the counties are working together irrespective of a lot of other things. And let me, let me pick two of those uh, important functions uh, for resiliency of the economy, and that's our airports. You know, FLL and MIA are two large airports that have very different regions. And in the old days, there would be arguments back and forth at the staff level about who's going to get what flight and who's going to get what airline. All that went away because the, airline, the airports themselves realized that the value of working together greatly exceeded the value of fighting each other for growth. And as, as a fact, both of them have grown greatly. And I say resilience because they are together an unbelievable element of resilience in the economy of this community. So that's one, I could name you 50 examples like that. All of them mostly done at the state level, I mean at the, at the staff level, not mm -hmm. done because you know, the commission said this and the state put this out, but they realized that the, the, uh, the capacity to work together made us much more resilient. So thank you, Compact, for what you've done. We can't wait to continue to work with you uh, over time. Um, we, we all have took a, a significant amount of learning um, this summer. I think we've shared, even shared that from a resiliency perspective uh, through the hurricane process. So let's keep going what we're doing, and, and I want to thank you all. Super, thank you. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. And I'd like to say thank you to the folks who are out here. Today has been a very gratifying day, partly because as I've talked to people in the group, I've heard over and over expressed the value and the love that exists in many of the people here from Monroe County. We've had a rough time lately. We've all had a bit of a rough time lately, but we were singled out to be the target and we've done rather well with it. We're doing well on both ends of our very long county and we're doing less well toward the middle and Big Pine down for those of you who have told me that you've spent so much time there and value it so highly. Thank you, thank you very much. And I'd like to also point out a very personal thing for me that represents our interdependence in a way that supports the efforts of this organization. After Hurricane Andrew, Monroe County's first responders were the first in the homestead. After Irma, they were among the first into Monroe County. We really 
have common challenges. Sea level rise is only one of those, but it's a huge one, and we all face it together. The solutions for each of us may be slightly different. In Monroe County, I, I sometimes think that we could serve as the poster child for everything that you don't want if you're experiencing sea level rise. We're 120 miles long. We're made up of, for the most part, very small islands. They are very low. And I find it kind of amusing that your, your response up here with the advent of a storm is to move people west because you're getting them out of the flood zone. Well, Monroe County has a little spot in Key West and a little spot in the upper Keys that is out of the flood zone. The rest of it is the flood zone. We don't have the luxury, nor have we ever had the luxury of debating about is sea level rise happening and is it going to change our future? Because I can assure you, it is going to change our future. Quite frankly, I, I suggested kind of humorously earlier today a change in the title of our meeting today. Because we could easily say, and I think many of you will agree with me, that we are, quote, buying our future. Everything that we talk about has huge, huge financial consequences. We are truly buying the future that some of us will not see, but it will be here. And it's going to force some very hard decisions. For those of us who are elected officials, it's going to force us to decide, are we going to do the right thing are we going to do the politically expedient thing? We'll find out. And we're doing well so far as indicated by this presence here today. So thank you so kindly. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> well, speaking of costs, uh, I thought I'd, my first question is going to be about infrastructure because infrastructure investment is one of the certainly one of the, the costliest um, types of decisions that, that come before a local government, any, any, any government. And so um, as we look out over the future, I'm wondering if you will share your perspectives with, with us about the infrastructure priorities for the region. Um, are our investments keeping pace with our needs? And, and, and your perspective, we, we would appreciate it, whether it's, it's regional or whether you want to focus sort of on your, the infrastructure's lo uh, needs locally or within your county. And I'd ask whoever wants to go first, just jump right in. Mayor Furr. They're not keeping, they're not keeping up yet, no. Um, there, there's, there's a, I mean, we're, we're, depending on which part of the infrastructure you're looking at, uh, we're, we're seeing things that we need to be looking at, mm -hmm. like FDOT has, we know what roads they've highlighted Here's a hot spot. Here's where the flood zones are. But money hasn't, all, hasn't been allocated to each one of those spots yet. We know that we're going to be having to probably move wells at some point from eastern to, to middle part. Money has not been allocated for that yet. Uh, at some point, we, you know, we, we have a gravity-fed uh, drainage all the way from the Everglades all the way out. At some point, we're going to have to have pumps that are, that are going to, to take care of that. So that money has not been allocated yet. You can kind of go down, right down, you know, through water, wastewater. Um, those those decisions, we've been kind of, we, it's almost like we've been going through the awareness era first. Mm -hmm. And now it's time for those big decisions to be determined and determined where that money comes from. I'll add that I think our biggest threat to being able to fund the infrastructure needs that, that we all have would be actions that are taken uh, by our legislature and by Congress. And we, I, we all recognize that these infrastructure repairs need to take place. I mean, we all recognize that we need to have a resiliency component in every one of our capital improvement projects, whether it's a park, a road, a fire station. Uh, but when we have a legislature that continues to tie our hands and our ability to raise local revenue, uh, when we are faced with a 
homestead exemption constitutional ballot initiative that for my county will reduce our revenues by $30 million uh, in one year and we were capped at how much we can play with our millage and we're looking at a $50 million shortfall and despite the fact that we passed uh, a one cent sales tax initiative that's to repair the infrastructure that we haven't been able to afford to repair over the last few years and we'll be, or the last decade, we'll be able to add resiliency components to those projects, but where we go and forward from there is going to be more difficult. When you've got a uh, Congress that has removed the earmark process, uh, when you, you know, and, and Senator Rubio, and I, I had it in my notes for later, but, you know, Senator Rubio has introduced, was it Rubio? No, actually, I think it's Congressman Rooney has introduced language to try to return the earmark process at least for water projects, uh, which would help you know, certain parts of the country tremendously, especially our vulnerable poor counties, to be able to get some of those federal tax dollars back here to do infrastructure repairs and water projects and Everglades restoration and everything else that would help our, our efforts combating sea level rise. Um, until that's done, we're gonna struggle. Uh, when you have a White House administration that right now is, you know, made a campaign promise for a $1 trillion infrastructure investment in our country, and one of the proposals on the plate right now is to reduce that to a $200 billion investment with an $800 billion local match in, in order to, uh, you know, to, you know, get your project closer to the top of that list, you will have to show that you have skin in the game, and by skin in the game, they will be looking for property tax or other tax increases to provide that revenue for that federal, you know, local match to be able to do those projects. And then we have a legislature that's restricting our ability to raise that revenue. It's a no-win situation, and we're going to continue to struggle to be able to meet those needs. So local government's going to have to take the lead, and that's gonna mean that we do fewer projects each year and we move at a slower pace and until those realities in Tallahassee and Washington change, we're gonna struggle. This morning I talked about uh, the water and sewer process in Miami-Dade County, but I didn't talk about the one that we all seem to be talking about a lot lately all through the region, that's transportation. South Florida in the, in the mid 60s, late, the late 50s to the late 60s, some of you might remember that, was the fastest growing regional area in the United States. Um, and we are still dealing with the impact of that change uh, on, on how we live and, and where we grow. But it wasn't just growth that was part of this process. The, the area changed significantly. So you had a fast growing area that was going through all kinds of change. Were it just growing fast like some of the areas in the Midwest were going through, that would have been significant. We would have had to find ways to deal with transportation. But the process of transportation has gone through as much change, and as, especially as we forecast change, as any of, of some of the other technologies that exist. So when we talk about mass transit anymore, some of us are saying, I don't know, building rail transit? That's a 1890s technology for a 2021 uh, need. And the cost is unbelievable. We built a, all by our little loan, some, a, a connection between the airport and downtown Miami. It's unbelievable per, per um, mile without buying the property. So we're looking at changing technologies that we can bring in, things that many of which we won't be here to see get put in place but allow us to deal with growth and change in the technology. Um, and that's gonna, be a, that's gonna be interesting because it will be less expensive, but it won't be a train. You know, those people who get upset with us because it's not gonna be rail are gonna say, well, I don't know that that's gonna work. Uh, talk to the city of Denver. The city of Denver built a beautiful mass transit system. It took them 10 years to raise the money design it and build it. By the time it got ready to open up, a lot of the growth had moved to another area. So people found themselves riding in their cars to the rail to go downtown. Well, we don't want that to happen. We don't want to be out of, out of style before uh, it gets finished. So let's look at technology and see where things are gonna go as much as we can 
and say, I, I attempt to, to address that through infrastructure, needs to be different. It needs to look at growth and change. Yes, I, I can comment here. I, I think in Monroe County, we're doing some things that we're all doing. Mm -hmm. We're looking at our vulnerabilities. We're doing mobile LIDAR right now, or we would be if we could get all the debris off the places they <laughs> need to drive. It'll be here a little late, but it'll be here. That tells us exactly on our road systems where we need to pay attention. Um, we need to establish those vulnerabilities throughout South Florida, actually, and I know that you're doing that. You've been forced to do that. Some of them are easy to see because you don't want to drive your car through them. Others are a bit more subtle because they're going to come in the future. We need to establish what, where we're going to place our investments. Monroe County may be a little different in the sense, well, I guess Monroe County, as we all know, is really different, but that may be another topic. Uh, but we may be a little different in the fact that we won't be able to protect all of our neighborhoods. That's not a topic we've talked about very much. We have some islands that are so low, we know they're going to be the first to flood. We're going to be faced with issues that are hard because they're going to affect people's lives. Is it wise to place limited infrastructure on an island that you know you're not going to be able to protect from rising water? Those are going to be some decisions that we really haven't even started to talk about out loud yet. So. This is the first time, I think, that this has been broached publicly. And it's not that we don't want to, it's that it's coming to the forefront. Like many of your decision points in the future are just appearing and you're suddenly recognizing the significance. In Monroe County, we can elevate, and we're doing that with two roads right now. They're very different communities. They're very different areas of the Keys, and we anticipate learning a lot. The neighborhoods where we are elevating these roads, and it's a real engineering feat, as you know, because some of you have done that, are welcoming them. Now, you get down to the details. You make a road higher, you also make a road wire, wider, there goes probably some front fences in front of homes. That's not going to be real popular. When you elevate, you have to handle the water. Otherwise, it's going to end up in that private property. So you're going to have to have pump stations in your neighborhood. That's not going to be very popular. Change seldom is very popular. But it's going to have to come, and we know that. We're starting to grasp that, and we're moving ahead, and we will continue. So just as a, a follow-up, because I, I'm, I'm listening to the challenges that, that you've, you've all outlined here. And, you know, I'm a resident, a long time, 23-year resident of Broward County myself, and, you know, I'm pretty tapped into these issues. Can, can any of you give us a sense of what is your sense within your county of, of the level of awareness in the public? I know this is a tough question, okay, because it varies, obviously, among communities, but Mayor Rice, you've mentioned we haven't started talking about it quite yet. There are gonna be very specific things that are un unpopular. What is the level of awareness, do you think? Do you think the experience of Irma has brought this to the fore? Certainly in Monroe County, I think that's probably true. And what, is, what are your counties doing to try to establish a context, a broad context, so that when these individual decisions come up, at least the public has a context to, to, to put those, in, those pain, more painful decisions into? I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but. Can, can I certainly. respond to that? I think Irma, which is a disaster, don't get me wrong, 
there are a lot of people hurting in the Keys right now. And I don't want to take away from that. But from a planning perspective, from a future perspective, it's going to be a very helpful thing because we have no other choice. We're dealt the hand that we're dealt. <coughs> we would not choose to have the destruction that we've seen. We're there. What can we do with it? Because at the same time, and this is kind of trite, but at the same time that it is a disaster, it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to harden our dwellings, to elevate them. What we lost was the older homes. You heard that earlier today, so I won't belabor it. <coughs> the homes that were at ground level. To give you some sense of the magnitude in only unincorporated Monroe County, we had 1,700 homes destroyed or significantly damaged. 1,700. We have 4,000 households displaced. Multiply that by the average number of people in the average household, and that's in excess of 10% of our population is displaced. This storm has definitely upset the apple cart. There's no question. Mm -hmm. It'll be up to us and our community to step forward to the future and build the environment. And I'm talking about the environment in a different sense than the physical environment, but to build a community that we would want folks to be living in in the future while remaining to keep the valued elements of the keys. No, we won't be going up significantly, I can assure you. Uh, so we really want to preserve the beauty of the keys, but we know that we're facing change that has accelerated at uh, an incredible pace here. and. It has, denial is a very, very powerful psychological tool. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of our people have engaged denial. Having been a clinical psychologist there for 40 years, I think I'm qualified to say that. <laughs> denial doesn't work very well with where we are today. That may, in the long run, help us. Thank you. I think your question is excellent because it's, it's mm -hmm. asking, you're asking what level of awareness there is. Mm -hmm. There is some level of awareness. For instance, in Broward County, people know, they know about the king tide. They see the flooding, they like that. They know to save water. They're not sure why. They, you know, we've got, we're saving, I think I just heard the number the other day, we, we have a, a water conservation uh, effort going on in Broward County. We've saved over a billion gallons of water. But most of the people don't know, you know, where that water comes from, mm -hmm. about the aquifers, you know, the depletion of aquifers. They don't, they, they don't know the mechanics of it. Um, and so if we're ever going to be able to, to ask, if we're going to at some point ask for a lot of money to do something, there has to be awareness. There has to be an understanding of the issues of what we're trying to do. If you start to, if you're, if we talk about having to move a wastewater treatment plant off the coast and move it a little bit further in, that's a big, that, you know, that's a big ask. Um, if you're, if you're trying to elevate, you know, areas, if you're trying, all these things, elevate roads, all those things are huge asks and people will not vote for them if they don't understand. We had an, we had an item on the um, ballot this last, in 2016. The transportation part passed, but the infrastructure failed. And that's, that's on us. Because we, I don't think we explained it well enough and, or made it clear enough why this was so important. We didn't make the case. And it's up to us to make the case. It's, and it's not easily understandable. Mm -hmm. And so it's going, you know, this means starting, and we are, we, are, we actually have a, have a uh, relationship with the school board and are, are trying from from, you know, from middle school to high school to, to, to make that the case for here's what's going on. 
But the reality is, it, it's complex. And it's, it's, I was a high school teacher for a long time. This would be a, this would be a tough ask to try to uh, teach a lot of high school students, much less the citizens uh, as, as a whole. But, it's, but we have to do it. So we have to find a way to do it. And, uh, and that means uh, working with people that know how to market things, working with people that know how to educate, and, 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 and make it so that people understand all these different issues. Lana, can you please? Sure, I'll add first, let me apologize. I've been battling a cold for about five days, and when they say cold medicine lasts four hours, well, I think it just wore off. <laughs> <laughs> so my apologies for coughing into the mic. Uh, I, I believe that, it, and as you mentioned, uh, the, the awareness, I mean, I can tell you two or three years ago, I don't think the media was ever reporting on every single king tide that right. happened, and we weren't hearing about harvest moons, and and everything that comes along with that. So, uh, so the, the, the awareness is increasing, which I think is a good thing. Uh, in Palm Beach County, I think Hurricane Irma was a huge wake-up call as we were starting to worry about coastal storm surge on the east, and we were worrying about a potential break in the dike, uh, Herbert Hoover Dike on the west side. You know, we started to feel that squeeze of where would people go, and people started paying attention. And, uh, and worrying about those things and wondering what we would do with all of that water and it's initiated conversations around the community. And the other thing that happened was the, uh, the new FEMA flood maps came out. And in my particular district, you know, most of the districts, the other six districts in Palm Beach County had anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand new uh, property parcels that went into the new flood zones. Uh, District six had 27,000. And so people were, you know, residents, property owners were starting to ask the question of why am I now suddenly in a flood zone? What's going on? And mm -hmm. it's initiated a bigger, more community-wide conversation. One of the uh, things that, that we go through as we update our comprehensive plan has always been part of the process that we've done it for years, is we send out a set of uh, questionnaires to people about elements in the plan and try to get them to participate. Now, I would not be telling you the truth if in the, fa in the past this was a wildly successful effort. You know, we used to tell ourselves we were doing great and we'd send them out and get 300 responses. I'm not too sure why, and, and, and I'll take all the, um, the glory for it because I did it all myself. <laughs> but I, I can't tell you why, but we got thousands of responses. Was it a response? And when we, people look at the issues that we had in the questionnaire about growth, was it a response when they looked at the issues about growth and they looked and thought about the, what happened with the hurricanes this year? Was it the functions of growth when they listened to complaints about traffic all the time? I'm not too sure what it was, but there was a response and oftentimes the responses answered the questions, and then the thing that they had the most fun with was writing on the bottom about what the hell they thought this was really all about. <laughs> That's interesting stuff. It is not scientific. I don't contend that this was a clear, uh, well-drawn sample, but it showed us, number one, that people weren't interested enough to return it to us. And number two, some of the comments that they made to us on the policies that were in them were really kind of interesting. So we're, we're thrilled. We're thrilled when we can get people to talk to us about the future. That's really what a large part of government's all about. But I can't tell you why, so we're still working on it. That's great. I, I do think, adding to that, I do think there's an increased interest in it right now. I do think there's, an, in, in almost all things, environmental. <coughs> and it, and uh, I, at least I see that a lot with the younger generation, for sure. But I think. I think it's almost across the board. And I think the time is ripe to try to get a lot of this information out because I do think people want to hear about it. They do want to know about it. Uh, it's up, like I said before though, it's up to us to figure out the avenue and the, and the venues for to get that information out. And I am glad, I know the Sun Sentinel's here and I know that they're covering this in a way that they have not covered this before, as well as I think a couple of other media outlets. And that's, that will help tremendously. And, it, and it's, uh, that's kind of what we needed. 
Well, thank you. And speaking of unscientific, I, I want to give you a little bit of encouragement. I spent a little bit of time at Dillard High School this okay. past week and uh, engaged with several uh, kids in the robotics program. And I talked to a little bit of, uh, a little bit of about the environment and climate change. And I was thrilled at how not only how much how aware they were, but how much they seemed to really care and mm -hmm. to be interested. So yep. it was a, a, a really wonderful couple of hours. Um, okay, so our, our time is almost over. So what I'd like to do is I'd like for you now to look into the future and um, both sort of zoom, zoom out and zoom in for us. Look at the next decade of the compact and tell us what you think our biggest challenges are gonna be. And then I want you to zoom back in and with that picture in mind, what does the next year look like for you on these issues and for your county um, headed in the direction of meeting those, those challenges in the next decade? Who wants to start? I'll go ahead and start right, on that one Turner, in case I you. have a coughing fit again. <laughs> 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 um, I'm gonna zoom out a decade and right now we've got four counties in this compact and there are 63 other counties in Florida. And if we don't, uh, I, I love the work that we're doing and because we keep it small, we're able to be more impactful but if the state doesn't have this conversation on a statewide level, uh, I fear that you know, we're the bottom of the state. The water is coming from the north and it comes south and we're, we're dealing with that. We're gonna get, like I, I mentioned earlier, we're gonna get squeezed from either coast. My brother is um, the number one cave diver in the world. He does all of the exploratory okay. diving in the cave systems, mm -hmm. particularly in North Florida. And he will tell you that what they're seeing in the deterioration in the spring system in North Florida, that'll impact all of us. And this, this water conversation, this, this uh, you know, sea level rise conversation that we're having needs to happen statewide. The springs are gonna start seeing saltwater intrusion, that feeds our aquifer, that feeds our water supply source in South Florida eventually. When we are looking at Orange County coming down the Kissimmee River, over four billion gallons of water flow into Lake Okeechobee and you can only get rid of about just over a billion gallons of that at a time. So we're about three for one in that area. And you've got a, a development project just north of the lake on Desiree Ranch, which will create a new city of 500,000 people possibly. And some of that water is gonna come into the Kissimmee region and some will go into the St. John's region. And that's more water than we can deal with. And you know, all of these, these regional conversations need to be happening outside of just our four counties. So 10 years into the future, I'd like to see a statewide climate compact plan. Mm. So, yes, I do. Yeah. And as, uh, as our current president travels to his winter White House on Palm Beach and deals with uh, king tides and flooding trying to get from the airport over to Mar-a-Lago, I hope that Washington will begin to recognize this. I hope that our legislators and staff in Tallahassee are permitted to be able to say the words climate change. Um, it, you know, they, they thank you. I mean, they have to, it has to be recognized at the state and federal level so that we can act more uh, efficiently and quickly at the local level. Uh, my immediate need in the next year is uh, number one, we have to hire our new sustainability coordinator because Natalie left us. Um, we are, I've got John Van Arnhem who is here today and he's our uh, deputy county administrator and has been the absolute leader in Palm Beach County on this issue. Uh, he's retiring, so we'll have some staff holes that we have to fill. Uh, but on a project, seeing the completion of the Herbert Hoover Dyke, I would like to see Congress fully appropriate that not only in the wake of Hurricane Irma, but in the sense of water quality and all the issues that we're gonna be facing in terms of dealing with more water as we see uh, hurricane storms intensifying over warmer seas and we've gotta get that infrastructure repaired right away. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, for, the, for this coming year, I'd like to see a full court press uh, from this compact and from every county to ask the Army Corps of Engineers for emergency preparedness study that would uh, kind of help us put together an entire blueprint of what what all our vulnerabilities are, what we need that would help us decide and help make the case for what's needed here. 
Um, I think that's uh, worth putting as much effort as we can. And uh, I think it's, it's worthy of this compact to do that. Uh, so that's where I see that for the next year. Uh, in the coming year, I, I see, I've seen pace um, take off, yeah, at least in Broward County, I've seen pace take off and I'm seeing uh, that is, that is the, the, the financial um, wherewithal to actually start to, to make you know, house, every, every little house, be able to have solar and things like that. It, that's, that's, um, that's exciting. Um, I'm seeing it just, it's, it's just um, taking off. I'd also like to see an entire network throughout these four counties of electric charging stations everywhere. Just a, a, as much as you have a, a gasoline station on every corner, I think we need to start thinking that's the way we, we, need, to, we need to do that. Um, and make it so, it, you know, I mean, you've got a chicken and egg. Well, well the, that, that's part of the, that's chicken. I don't know if that's chicken or not. <laughs> but uh, we need to have those charging stations. And then uh, Broward County is in the middle of auditing every single building, uh, what the energy uh, emissions are. We should be getting that audit back. As soon as we get that back, it's time to figure out how to lower all of them and get it down to our goals. And I know the goals of this entire compact. So uh, we have a big year ahead of us, but I think we can do this. Indeed, indeed. Uh, I, I, I look out 10 years and I see a population that's changing a lot. And, uh, you know, it's not just a function of age, it's not just, but it's a function of jobs and it's a function of people from different parts of, of the world you know, continue to move here. And cultural impacts uh, uh, that we're going to have, uh, again, jobs, we, we need to make sure that when we're done, uh, we look at uh, what we've done to the economy and said we put a lot more jobs in, in computer-aided design and a lot more jobs in working in the hotels and not a whole lot of jobs in the middle. And that really worries me. It scares me to death. And so what I would like to think about, again, thinking about the resiliency of our economy, is to focus on that middle. And I don't mean to sound like a... Uh, a, a, uh, a, a statement out of a, out of a uh, six o'clock news story. But I do want to make sure that we are sensitive as we look at who's coming here as far as businesses are concerned. And we're recruiting people all the time. That, they, that there's, a, there's a complement of jobs there so that we can continue to have a, a, a resilience in our economy where everybody can participate. Thank you. No, yeah, I see Amos Hahn. I would like to echo what you just said. The economy and the finances drive most everything, guys. And the recognition of that by this compact and bringing in the business community can't be overemphasized. We really have to do that. We have to broaden beyond that. And I love your idea of the statewide growth. I, I believe the time has come for that. I don't think the storm only woke up people in the Keys who chose to ignore the issue. I think it woke up people up the state of Florida. We all got a wake up call. And I think we can use this event as a herald for a change into the future because there is an awareness today that wasn't there, what, three and a half months ago? Uh, some of the challenges are workforce, as you say. You're looking at your workforce range and saying, we're missing it with certain segments of that group. We're looking at the entire workforce that probably moved to Dade County, um, pretty much. That's an exaggeration, of course. But the homes that were destroyed were the homes they were living in. They were the older homes. They were the homes that could be rented affordably. One of the tremendous goals that we have for the next year is to clear the way so that we can reconstruct affordable workforce housing in the Keys. 
And frankly, we're talking, we're, we're not so much talking about affordable housing in the Keys. That's a joke. Total joke. We're looking at affordable workforce housing. Since the storm, I am told that rent rates in Monroe County have increased by 50%. I'm sure that varies some with the individual situation, but it's not an exaggeration. Uh, we've got to build that segment of our living ability back to attract perhaps some of the people who've left, some of the people who've always wanted to be there, like yours truly in 1973. Uh, we got paid in sunshine, not money. And I think many of you understand that. There are those people who want to be there. They will come. We have to be ready for them. Well, if I may be so bold as to speak for the compact, although I have no authority to do so, but I will, I will say thank you uh, to all of you and to, I will include Mayor Jimenez, who I know would be here with us if, if he could have been. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you for, for being here, but also thank you for leading and, um, and for continuing this tradition of the highest level leadership among the partner organizations. And I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists for closing out day one. Well, once again, I think no better closing could be delivered. Shannon, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you to our mayors, deputy mayor. I think it'll be really exciting um, as we look at the summits next year and over the ensuing uh, decade to think how many of the uh, milestones referenced here uh, will be documented in our conversations as we move forward. Looks like there's a, a celebratory announcement to be made. October the 24th. Of course. Of course. October the 24th, 25th, 2018, we'll be meeting in Miami-Dade County uh, for the next one of these. We can only hope that it's even closely as good as the one you guys have done. All right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's program. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be building on this conversation and with a, more of a focus on other uh, regional collaborations, uh, inter-regional collaborations, sharing of model initiatives, and uh, promotion of energy and transportation breakthroughs, as well as other innovations and resilience. So uh, a little bit different program. I think it's going to be tremendous. Uh, it'll start at 8.15 uh, with a light breakfast and coffee available starting at 7.30. Uh, we invite you all once again to stay for the evening reception that will begin in just a moment in the lobby and continue till 6.30. There's appetizers. You each have a drink ticket and uh, your name badge. Additional uh, purchases can be made beyond your ticket. Uh, once more, we have our press event also happening at 5 o'clock just now in room 301. And uh, let's see. So take advantage of the reception, please. And we hope you enjoy an evening of dining out here in Broward County. And with that, we're adjourned. Enjoy your evening. Thank you.